on the other side of that same spectrum, there are the unwitting who become involved in criminality by circumstance. And fairness for them is likely something along the lines of uh, maybe treatment for uh, abusive uh, situations or uh, opportunity that needs to be brought to them for economic advancement to then uh, remove the essential motivations for getting involved with criminality to some extent as well. So that sense of fairness and justice is, is core to my thinking about what criminal justice actually is about. Welcome to The Legacy Project. My name is Jim Koppel, president of the Servant Ford Foundation. We're an organization committed to leadership development with a specific focus on service. This podcast and its related activities are about sharing the legacy we have inherited and discussing the legacy we still want to create. Legacy is more than cars, houses, boats, and material possessions that we want to leave to the next generation. Other legacy is about core values and beliefs that we inherited from a previous generation. They are the values that shaped us and defined us. Legacy is also about the values we develop or create that can be passed on or shared with the next generation. We will interview people from various backgrounds and walks of life. Some are famous, some, well, maybe not so famous, and others are simply our neighbors, our friends, people who live ordinary lives doing extraordinary things. Become part of this project by being intentional about legacy. More than just memories, but principles that have guided our lives and shaped our decisions. What is the legacy you choose to create? That's what we want to discover. Today we're interviewing George Rice with Skyhawk Global Associates. George, I've known for a number of years. We work together at the National Crime Prevention Council. George is a former law enforcement and intelligence agent. We're very fortunate to have him in conversation. We've worked on a number of different projects together. Uh, he's one of the more creative, imaginative people I've worked with in law enforcement. So, George, it's a pleasure to have you a part of our podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Jim. Yeah. So, George, the Legacy Project really focuses on uh, the influences in our life. Who has shaped us? What has defined us beyond sort of the material possessions that we normally talk about when it comes to legacy and also the legacy that we want to create? So let me begin just with some basic biographical questions. Uh, where are you from originally? Yeah, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, um, the west side, um, which has been depicted so many times in so many crime dramas over the past uh, three decades or so of television. Uh, people know it in that vein, but it's also a lovely, lovely place to uh, be in certain neighborhoods as well. And uh, it's, um, it's kind of the home I came from, so to speak. So in terms of your development as a young person, parents, coaches, ministers, people of influence, who are some of the people that help shape your core values, who you are as a person? Yeah, it'd be hard to go forward with a conversation like this without going first and very deliberately to my father. And to some extent, men of his era because of the, I'll call it persistence and determination that they showed at all times with you know groundbreaking advancements, oftentimes in the face of relentless obstruction uh, my dad, for example, was one of 10 children. He came from very deep and abject poverty, uh, but was, a, was able to then create a family, a home for us, um, you know, changing his life, uh, again, using that persistence and determination. So those folks like himself who came of age just after World War II, um, but had to certainly deal with um, a lot of obstacles along the way, major, major influence on me. And it's hard to think of someone else because he was such a deep influence. What did he do professionally, George? He started out by going into the Air Force, actually, uh, at the age of 17, early. Uh, one of the very first people of color in the new Air Force that uh, President Truman had created after uh, it was desegregated. Um, when he came back to America after serving in Europe uh, on peacekeeping and policing missions in the UK and Germany, he uh, got into uh, the insurance industry, interestingly enough, but uh, at the outset, it was very much in a labor force uh, side of it, working the uh, loading docks, but was able to work himself into white collar jobs at the same insurance company where he worked for over 30 years. Yeah. Are you close to your siblings? Do you, do you connect very often with your siblings? Uh, I have just one sister. My sister and I are actually quite close. She's oh. like um, a bit of a best friend to me for sure. Yeah. 
That's great. Yeah. So where did you go to school, George? Um, high school, um, at Mount St. Joseph High School in Baltimore, then on to college uh, right after high school in central Pennsylvania at uh, what was then called Alvernia College, now Alvernia University. And then uh, much later, 20 year break in undergrad to grad work at George Washington University in DC. Tell me something about your law enforcement background, the work that you've done, agencies or organizations that you've worked with. Sure, yeah. Um, interestingly enough, my intention was to become an attorney. And uh, as I got to the end of undergraduate work, um, I was looking at the loans I had yet still to make a payment on <laughs> and then understanding <laughs> how that was going to probably at least triple with law school. I decided to go off into the world and work uh, for a while. And, um, you know, it was the 1980s. Uh, the drug war was big, hot, heavy, um, fairly fashionable to some extent as well. And um, I thought I'd maybe go into that for a while. So I started out as a private investigator, actually working in a series of domestic type cases, insurance cases, uh, wrongful death cases, so which is essentially a civil case and, and a homicide case in, the, in terms of investigation. And I saw that um, I could do this, this stuff as it were, uh, as an investigator more so than perhaps in a patrol and enforcement environment because I was getting relatively good at the investigative side of it. DEA was hiring, I applied uh, and uh, went into the academy and then spent the next 10 years as a DEA agent working primarily in the Baltimore area, but traveling with cases uh, to parts south and then parts south of the border as well. What motivated you to think about a career in law enforcement? What made that appealing to you? Yeah, I wasn't at the time very sure of it, but over the years I have become uh, far more sure of it, I would say. My father's position in the US Air Force was with the Air Police. And he did a number of investigations. He also uh, went into roles whereby he was helping with basic policing, particularly in the UK when he was living there. And uh, I think his stories to me about how that went for him and the bit of satisfaction he got out of it by being a contributor to society played out in my thinking far more so than I realized. Um, but after reflecting on it uh, a couple of decades later, I was able to think through that that was prob probably a very prime motivation for my thinking of criminal justice as a career. So I want to kind of peel back just a little bit more on the why in terms of your father's influence in your life, certainly positional, because he had been in, involved in law enforcement or policing. But what, what were the values that he put in you or you took from him and your relationship to him that made you want or motivated you to go into law enforcement or public service? Great question, yeah. And I, I think uh, undergirding it all is um, trying to create an, uh, uh, sort of a, an avenue and an environment of fairness is very um, sort of deeply embedded in me. And I'm certain I got that from my father, whereby fairness could be that someone is a player that takes away from society in an extensive criminal environment, particularly with organized crime and the like. And that fairness for society means that in that case, the person probably does need to be prosecuted or removed from society for some, to some extent. But on the other side of that same spectrum, there are the unwitting who become involved in criminality by circumstance. And fairness for them is likely something along the lines of uh, maybe treatment for uh, abuse uh, situations or uh, opportunity that needs to be brought to them for economic advancement to then uh, remove the essential motivations for getting involved with criminality to some extent as well. So that sense of fairness and justice is, is core to my thinking about what criminal justice actually is about. So you at some point transitioned out of law enforcement specifically, and you moved into other areas of public service. I know I worked with you at the National Crime Prevention Council, and then also worked with you when you were at the Council of Governments in Washington, D.C. How did that transition for you? What motivated you to make those moves? Yeah, another insightful question there, Jim. I, and um, this one I actually know very deeply because it was a very considered decision. Um, as you well know from your time in and around the criminal justice world, it is exceedingly rare that folks go into a federal law enforcement career, spend a decade doing that job, and then um, leave it to do something else. Mm -hmm. uh, but my motivation was actually very, very deliberate. Towards the end of my time with DEA, 
I had a collateral position for the Baltimore office working on demand reduction, which is essentially the marketing and education arm of the DEA. And then also working in the public affairs function, uh, leading as a public information officer for, this, for the Baltimore office. And then also doing a couple of short stints at the DEA headquarters, where I worked in the Office of Congressional and Public Affairs on a temporary role. And in the midst of all of that, I got a real taste for public policy work, for advocacy and awareness work, educational issues and the like, and decided that I think that is kind of more me, so to speak, and then took it upon myself to uh, hone those skills even more so as I was considering making the move away from DEA and onto public service more widely, and then made that move once I got an offer to work with Jim Brady and the team at the Brady Center. Oh, that's right. I'd forgotten about that part <laughs> yeah. of your career. Yeah, that was, a, that was a major transition and an important role. We're talking with George Rice at, uh, from Skyhawk Global Associates and a former friend and colleague. Well, he is a friend and colleague, uh, <laughs> not a former one, uh, but um, has had an interesting career and has had a major influence on a lot of policy and programs as well as a lot of lives. When you think about the legacy you have, George, and uh, what you've inherited, what is the legacy you want to leave behind? You may not think about that a lot. You're still relatively young, but uh, what is the legacy you want to leave behind? Sure. And thank you for that youthful comment. I'm not feeling that way <laughs> of late. <laughs> uh, but I, I think um, I kind of think of that in two veins. They're intertwined, but I do think of it somewhat separately of professionally and personally. And I, on the professional side, one of the things that I have very much focused on is to try to be someone who led, and I've led three different organizations, uh, and now actually in the private sector as well, leading my company. But I, I've always wanted to be someone who has led from within, trying to keep the organization as flat as can be. Obviously decision makers have to be just that and make decisions and lead. But I always wanted to be someone who maintained a focus on the needs of others, the people within the enterprise, you know, the staff, the employees and the like, and obviously the people who were affected by the organization's mission. But I really, really embrace that um, term of inner leader. And um, that's, I hope I can be remembered in that fashion uh, in terms of my legacy. And then on the personal side, uh, the most obvious piece, I want to be remembered as a loving and supportive husband, first and foremost, and a steadfast friend, and certainly a caring and trustworthy family member uh, to kind of round out it all, out of all of it, I think. And personally and professionally, I think it's kind of the, the way I look at it. So I ask a question periodically, and this uh, we can tweak this in a variety of ways, but I, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Leap Year. There is a scene where a young woman goes to Ireland and she's having this encounter or discussion with a love interest in this movie. And he asks this question, he says, if your house were to catch on fire, uh, what one thing would you grab beyond people and pets? What's the one thing you might grab out of your house that kind of summarizes the legacy that you've inherited? Yeah, that is such a, an insightful way to look at how one makes decisions in the moment, no doubt about it. Yeah. And uh, just as a side note, I did spend some time in Dublin trying to dig into my family's past. My um, paternal grandmother is from Ireland. So interestingly enough, I, oh. I spent time going through the records in Dublin uh, a few years ago yeah. to try to find where the family originated from and, and the like and had to get what amounts to uh, a bit of like an archivist license, like a permit to go through the records. Oh, yeah, and like, sure. Which I didn't know right. I would need when going there to do that. So I wound up with this, <laughs> this card that uh, sort of uh, gives me that sort of validation. But um, to your point, I, uh, I kind of think of it in, the, in, again, two senses where there's a practical and there's the impractical. <laughs> And I think I'll start with the latter because it doesn't make any sense to even think about it, but it's, it pops into my mind. Impractical, uh, I would want to grab my vintage record collection <laughs> and try uh, to race out with, <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, like, I could really like grab a hundred albums and race out of the house, not possible. <laughs> or my antique typewriter that I cherish. Um, um, but on the very uh, deep practical side of it, the first thing I would certainly do is to uh, make sure I grab my wife, that she was safe, and uh, we were yeah. able to get out of the house. And uh, more yeah. practically along those lines, um, the keys to the car in case we needed to get away. <laughs> so, get away. <laughs> that would probably be how I look at it. <laughs> yeah, that's practical. I forgot, George, let's talk about this for a minute. You uh, uh, 
I forget the name of the group. You uh, partner with some others. You you play the role of Sammy Davis Jr., I believe, uh, the Jersey Boys. Is that correct? Uh, close, uh, the Rat Pack, yes. And yeah, I played a, a, a Sammy Pack. Davis Jr. character who was probably about twice his height. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Why your interest in the Rat Pack? How did how did you make that? How did you get into that? What what influenced you to, to to do that? You you guys were quite good. I remember seeing you perform several times. Yeah, thank you for attending those shows. By the way, I appreciate that. Um, as you <laughs> well, well know, yeah, they were all fundraisers. We worked in essentially a nonprofit environment, really, to fund monies to concerns of police survivors and other organizations that are similarly positioned, but mm -hmm. this one is very deliberately led a, yet another sort of legacy piece from my father who was a huge Frank Sinatra fan. And um, uh. I have a friend who, um, his name is actually Frank, <laughs> who has a, um, a, a, a sort of a show with his wife whereby he performs not as Sinatra, but he does a lot of Sinatra tunes. And we got the idea, Frank and I, that we could build out his act to be a full on Rat Pack act and bring in Dean Martin and then several different types of guest yeah. characters around the way. And we spent um, about eight years doing that uh, on and off and providing funds to these organizations along, along the lines. And it was just great fun as well. Did you do any recording? Yeah, we do uh, have a couple of videos on VHS even. <laughs> this was a while ago. <laughs> yeah. And some That's news coverage, funny. interestingly enough. We were covered yeah. by... Um, uh, by news outlets on um, well, a few occasions, actually. Yeah, it's funny. VHS. I, I somebody sent me a piece of music a couple of weeks ago, and I sent it to me as a CD. And I I don't have a CD player anymore. I mean, it's just kind of wow. <laughs> well, the technology e evolves ever so rapidly in that process. So I, I'm I'm kind of curious in terms of your vinyl record collection. Um, why? <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah. why do you have a vinyl record collection yeah it is certainly um shall we say dated <laughs> no doubt about it yeah. um well it's coming they're coming back yes <laughs> indeed yes there are some new prints of yeah. miles davis stuff and things like that actually but um yeah. Yeah. i have this fond um memory of listening to records um at my the homes where i grew up with my family and hearing that slight crackle of the needle in the grooves and yeah. the way in which wave sound, which is part of a vinyl record rather than digital sound, picks up on how the nuances of how the orchestra sounds, uh, more so as if you were kind of there. Um, you know, the digital is obviously um, uh, a little bit of different sound. It's clean, certainly, but it doesn't have that sort of wave, um, uh, uh, I guess, picture to it, if you will. So um, I really like that. And I've just over the years bought a number of vintage albums. Um, some I just, I inherited from my family as well along the way, but um, just kind of like that, remembering the crackling of the albums in the, uh, the home basement from years ago. Well, did you have a music background? Did you study music? <laughs> I wish I had. <laughs> yeah. I, no, no background there, but I, I, had, I did play drums in bands here and there. Mm -hmm. um, and we do have a music room in our house with a full setup of microphones, keyboards, guitars, the whole bit actually. Um, but uh, no formal training, which, uh, which may have shown in some of my depictions of Sammy Davis. <laughs> We're talking with uh, George Rice with uh, Skyhawk Global Associates. Uh, work with George on a number of projects out of law enforcement, crime prevention, and uh, he's had an interesting legacy. He's made a great contribution. George, talk to me for a few minutes why you think it's important that we remember the legacy that we've inherited and that we be intentional about the legacy we want to create. Yeah, that's, I think that's something of, that needs to be a great focus in my view. Um, I stand on so many shoulders that I can't count them or recount them right now in terms of conversation here over probably 400 years of understanding and even 15,000 years back for the other part of my family. But the way in which America has been shaped as a country has so many contributors that we all sort of stand on all of their shoulders. And for me, um, coming from a multi-ethnic background, 
um, the um, unintentional um, immigrants, um, the intentional immigrants that are part of my past, the indigenous folks that are part of my, uh, my family as well, all come together for me at least to create what I think is actually the legacy of America. Um, good or bad or indifferent, it all, we're all there and it's who we are as a nation. Um, I hope we can find a way to more deeply embrace that as a country as we continue to move forward in advance. Um, but that's, that's the picture that I see as well. And I think also that um, this is a very deliberate part of my thinking about um, people, family, culture, uh, governance. I don't think there is such a thing as a self-made person. I just don't think that exists. Everyone has something that someone else brought to their table to make them who they are. It could be sometimes inheritance of capital that one uses to start a business or buy a first home. It could also be an inheritance of understandings of personalities that can be imparted to an next person where they get insights that others just don't have. Um, it could be ethics about hard work so that you can really make the better of your own life based on what someone gave you or understandings otherwise. But I, I just don't buy into the self-made person uh, concept because I just think there are so many outside contributions. Hmm. So uh, you had indicated earlier in our interview here today that uh, you went to Ireland and you started doing sort of genealogical research. Uh, what motivated you to do that? Yeah, um, unanswered questions. Um, mm -hmm. Granted, uh, given the number of aunts and uncles I have um, and a huge family there, and quite frankly, um, a number of my father's siblings also had large families of five, six or seven children. So there's a huge diaspora of our family. <clears throat> but no one really knows the distinct origins of my grandmother's family. Um, there's lore, you know, there are conversations um, there. Are, we know some names here and there. Um, many of us try to use some of the online platforms, uh, but they don't serve us terribly well because the record keeping was uh, not so great in the poor communities from which most of my family have come from. But I just wanted to get a better understanding. And I, I found some things, but I still have quite a few unanswered questions as well. Yeah, that's a good reason. My uh, stepdaughter is a genealogist and she majored in that in college and it's been a remarkable resource in helping to us to understand our family and our legacy. And uh, the irony of it is, is that so much of my family history is rooted in the military class in the U.S., dating back to the French and Indian War. Uh, but I was a conscientious objector. <laughs> exactly. And, uh, <laughs> and so th those, kind of, uh, those kind of tensions are interesting. So, George, last question I really want to ask, and I really appreciate uh, the time you've taken and the responses you've given. It's been extremely insightful. Is um, what would you say to young people? I mean, it's interesting to me in the Legacy Project, uh, my book, The Seeker, Bring Me the Horizon, is a part of it. We're doing video vlogs and, of course, this podcast. And um, it seems somewhat natural for my generation, at least the baby boomers, we're thinking about the legacy that we've created. Uh, but also I'm discovering that in young people, there's a curiosity or they're being challenged to think about the legacy they can create, that we should remember our past, but we should be intentional about the legacy that we form. Um, what would you say to a young person about being intentional uh, of the legacy they create? Yeah, and I understand where the question's coming from. And I think you're onto something here because of the way our culture moves at such a, a more swift pace of late. I think it's um, challenging sometimes for people younger than us <laughs> who yeah. um, have to de deal with uh, a little more differently than we do that fast pace. And I think the thing that comes to mind for me is be a good friend. Um, mm. I think that's incredibly important. I'm very fortunate to have a tremendous best friend, my friend Joe. Uh, we are highly supportive of one another. And the importance of that cannot be underestimated in my view. And I think commensurate with that is to uh, a legacy of sort of maintaining an awareness of one's surroundings is helpful. Uh, interpersonal, physical, professional. And I'm not speaking about mistrust here, but more so mindfulness um, so one has yeah. the understandings of all of the intersectionalities of life and how that plays out in perhaps being a good friend. So uh, leaving this world, having um, been thought of as a good friend to multiple people 
um, as much as one can be, certainly, uh, based on one's resources, I think that um, that is a very key component in my thinking of it all, Jim. Yeah, that's powerful, George. So, George, I just realized I cannot leave this interview without at least spending a minute or two talking about the fact that we are both boat people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, I'm a sailor. You're a power guy. <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> uh, what, 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 is, what, is, what does being on the water mean to you? I mean, what got your interest in boats and the water and the... Um, being out there in that, uh, well, I won't use my adjectives. I'll let you speak to it. <laughs> <laughs> Sailing and power boating, never the twain shall meet, huh? <laughs> yeah. To meet, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, I think we are probably the closest those two things get, you and I together. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah, I have an uncle who, uh, from, who's from the Bahamas, who um, Laura has it that he was involved in some level of smuggling in the uh, 30s and 40s, but uh, I just don't buy that. I think it's just uh, family lore, but who knows? Um, but he taught me to uh, captain boats when I was very young. Um, I started um, somehow driving his boat and amazing amount of trust behind it I was, as I was five or six years old. Um, all power boats along the Chesapeake Bay. Um, and um, they eventually moved to Florida and we lost a little bit of touch until he passed away in the late 70s. But um, I kind of kept that as a de decided feature of what I wanted to do when I became an adult and was perhaps able to afford a vessel of my own. And um, that was the beginning of it all. And I decidedly thought of myself as a boater since I was five or six, even though I didn't have one <laughs> until another couple of decades later. Yeah. Um, but what it means for me is detachment um, and serenity. Um, you know, I'd, I've never bought very fast boats and things like that that sort of create um, uh, adrenaline and the like, more so about the cruising, uh, the anchoring, the being at the marina, at the dock, hanging out. It's all of those ways in which a boat can be to some extent a second home and take you away from the normal, regular, everyday life is kind of really where I go with it. That's powerful, George. I, I, I connect in so many ways with that. When I uh, hit, when I lived in Washington, D.C., and would head out to the Chesapeake, that sense of everything just stopped, and now I was focused on the boat and the water, and uh, for me, in terms of sailing, um, and I also developed an interest as a child. My father, during the Second World War, served on a um, destroyer where the captain was from Newport, Rhode Island, and he kept a sailboat on the destroyer <laughs> that when they were they were in a safe place or whatever, he would drop that sailboat and he and my dad would sail. And my dad would tell those stories. And ever since I was just a young boy, I always wanted to sail. And uh, I went to school in Boston. And the first weekend I was there, I went down to the Charles River and rented my first boat and I was hooked forever. Uh, but the same kind of feeling of attachment. And I just got to say, George, that you being a powerboat guy, uh, if everything else fails, you could go into smuggling. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> it's in my blood, apparently. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, we've been talking with George Rice of Skyhawk Global Associates, a good friend and colleague uh, who shared with us his reflections and the meaning, the legacy that he's inherited and the legacy that we should create. George, thanks so much for being a part of the Legacy Project. My sincere thanks to you, Jim. Great being with you. To find out more information about this conversation and other Legacy Podcast episodes, go to ServantForge.org. Please subscribe to us on your favorite podcast app and consider leaving us a review. We want to hear from you. We want to get your ideas and your opinions. I have a new book that corresponds with the Legacy Project titled The Seeker, Bring Me the Horizon. You can find a copy of it on Amazon or your preferred book distributor. The book corresponds closely with these podcasts. The podcast episode was produced by Matt Erickson and edited by Carissa Erickson. The music is by David Hyde. Please look for a new episode of our podcast coming out soon. Remember, you have inherited a great legacy. You have an opportunity to create a great legacy. Engage your past to build a future.